fun. <laughs> Hello, everyone. H Hello, Jeremy. Jer Jeremy. Jeremy. <laughs> so Call of Duty. Yes. Hello. Good morning, everyone. So good to be with all of you this morning. Can you just turn to the person next to you and say hello? You know, I want to, I always do this. I always honor the worship team uh, every time I come up here, you know, because most of the time I'm on stage somehow, either singing or playing or whatever. So, you know, I know um, the effort that goes into every set the effort, the heart uh, that goes into each worship set. So I want to honor our worship team. And I always, I always enjoy, I always really love just being part of the congregation and singing and praising and, and honoring God and lifting His name up high. Amen? Yeah, so th thank you, worship team. How is everyone doing today? Okay, let's, let's get away from these people. Are, are you alive? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> if, if, after, if after worship, you're not alive, something wrong, huh? <laughs> That's right, this week. Hello. Yeah, okay, and these people here? Yes. Hello, good to see, you, especially those who are new and um, with us for the first time. I want to welcome you. Uh, so good to have you with us. I want to acknowledge even those who have joined us online on our live stream. Hello, you know, we acknowledge your presence with us. And I believe that, you know, as a whole community, as a whole community, we will, we will hear from God and learn from God together. Amen. Amen. So, you know, by way of a quick recap, you know, we have been in the book of Acts, um, more or less, <laughs> uh, since, since June. Uh, we have had, you know, a couple of speakers come in and speak to us, but we have more or less been in the book of Acts. You know, we want to see, since Pentecost, we want to see how the early church, how the early church is really a model for us today. Because we want to be that, that, like that early church, isn't it? We want to be a loving church, a caring church, a praying church, a worshipping church, and even a learning church. And that is God's model for us. And so we want to learn from that as well. And we also learned that um, the Antioch church was an important hub for, for uh, the Gentile mission, for God to move the gospel out and for people to, to come to know him, not just in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And so the Antioch church was an important hub. And we learned, the last time I was speaking here, we learned from one of the leaders of the Antioch church, Barnabas, and how he raised, how he, he advocated for Saul, who was then after that, Paul. And you know, last week, Reverend Francis also talked about the fellowship of believers. And today, we will, we will touch a little bit about that as well. But today, we want to land on this man. We remember the last time I spoke, we, we, talked about, we talked about Saul, but more in the context of Barnabas. Today, we want to look at Saul himself. You know, he then became the apostle Paul. Okay, Saul and Paul, same men, same men. He had the name early on. Uh, Saul is his Hebrew name. Paul is his uh, Greek, more like a, uh, a name where he, uh, he, he then used because he was moving out internationally in that sense. But it's one and the same guy. And Saul, then after that Paul, was probably the most pro prolific person in, in, in moving the gospel out to the Gentile church. And so today we want to look at the actual turning point, the actual turning point itself for Saul and the encounter that he had with Jesus that changed his life. Okay, and then we will realize that although um, Saul's conversion or call, whatever you want to say about him at that point, it, it is also um, can relate to us even today. Amen? So come, let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we lift your name on high. We lift your name on high. Lord, you are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be honored. And you're worthy, Lord, to be lifted high. Lord, it is truly our honor, Lord, to be in your presence. Lord, we don't ever take it for granted. But when we come in, we want to come in in a state of reverence and awe, Lord, of the one who made us, the one who created heaven and earth. 
Today, Father Lord, I pray that you open our hearts, Father Lord, as we posture ourselves to hear from you. Father, we pray, Lord, that you help us. We, we put aside, Lord, all distractions. We, we incline our hearts and we open our ears so we can hear directly from you today. Say, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Uh, come and move in our midst. You are the one who will teach us. You are the one who will stir in our hearts. And you are the one who will draw us to you. So come and take your rightful place, Holy Spirit. Be so clear and evidently moving in our hearts today as we hear from you and we hear your call in our lives. So Father, we thank you. We honor you. We bless you. Be in our midst. In Jesus' name. In God's people say... Amen. Have you heard of this term, the road to Damascus experience? I mean, if you've been in church for some time, you would have heard this term, right? Road to Damascus experience. But do you know that it's also already considered an idiom in the English language, right? The, the dictionaries, they, they look at this idiom and they say, oh, it is, it's to represent a point of time in your life where there was a, a sudden change. There was something, uh, 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 an event that was very important that not just changed your opinions, but your beliefs. They call it the road to Damascus experience. It is actually based on Saul's encounter in Acts 9, and that's where we will, we will really um, sit in today in Acts 9. And this account is so significant that it's not just uh, once, it was written three times in the book of Acts, it appeared three times. But to fully appreciate the importance of this event, I think we need to understand Saul's background a little bit more. Because you, if you just see Saul like that, it might just... You, you may not understand the full extent of where he came from before. You know, in my last message, I shared that Saul was a passionate, motivated, dedicated, what? Persecutor of the Christians, of the people that followed Jesus. You see, Saul was born in Tarsus. You know, Tarsus is like a little mini Athens at that time. You know, uh, it was very cultured, very educated. And, and so he grew up in a culture that way. And he came also from a uh, religiously orthodox Jewish family. Uh, and they basically devoted their lives to the Jewish order. So around about the time, I, I think, okay, uh, possibly in his teens, the family moved to Jerusalem, and that's where he then came under uh, the tutelage of a very important man called Gamaliel. And he then became a Pharisee, because uh, Gamaliel was the teacher. You know, there are some there are teachers, and then there are the teachers, right? Gamaliel was a very important man, and he was very highly respected. And Saul came under his tutelage. So, you know, he was like really climbing the ranks of the Pharisaic order. Saul himself, he prided himself, okay? He prided himself on being the best possibly in, in, in upholding uh, the laws, in legal obedience, like he was like up there. So he really prided himself on that. So, when suddenly there were people saying, hey, there's this man, Jesus, we're going to follow him. And then they are like spreading this, this news, right, that Jesus raised, got raised from the dead. He is the Messiah and all that. Wow. He was, Saul literally saw it as an affront and an assault to his God. So you must understand this, this was him. That's why he was very zealous in eradicating these people, the cult in that sense, the ones who are causing the, the, the Jews to become apostates. You know, he was very zealous to, to get rid of them. In fact, it sounds, you know, they are called the people of the way. They're called the people of the way. And so it sounds quite cultish if you want to put it that way at that time. So in Acts 9, let's see in the passage here. It says here in verse 1, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Let's look at this word still. What does still mean? Still means that he was already doing it. 
And in Acts 8, we see that Saul was, was at the murder and the martyrdom of Stephen. He was there. He approved it. You know, they, they, he was there. And not only that, in Acts 8, it says that Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Okay, so that was like Acts 8. Okay, in Acts 8, verse 1 to 3, we will see that's what, that was the background to what uh, Acts 9 is saying. So Saul was still, he was doing it then, we don't know how long ago before that, but he's still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest, he took it one step further, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, it sounds quite... <laughs> The way, right? Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And you must realize that Damascus, Damascus is um, about 150 miles away from Jerusalem. So this is the extent to which Saul was willing to go to eradicate these people. It was about a week's travel by, by foot. So he would go all the way to a place like Damascus to stop the spread of the gospel. You think about it, okay? If you want to stop something, where do you go? You go to the source. Remember when we were at the height of the COVID in Singapore, right? Whenever we saw, whenever there were reports of people who got COVID, what did they go? They went to the cluster and then they isolated everybody from that cluster so that it would not spread. In the same way, when Saul, went, Saul was going to Damascus because Damascus was kind of like uh, the place where, where people congregated trade routes and people were hearing the gospel and they were taking it out to, different, to other regions. So he was like going to the source, I'm going to Damascus to stop this from happening. And so this was Saul. He wanted to do as much damage as possible to the way and to stop the spread as he believed it. To him, it was like a virus that he had to stop. But he really saw it as something that was correct. You know, if, for Saul, when he, ref, when he referred to himself, when he wrote to the, to the Philippian church, he said, if someone thinks that they have reason to put confidence in flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. He saw himself as faultless, blameless. He was like agreeing to kill people, move people to, to prison, and he saw that as faultless. So you must understand that he, he saw it as God's will, that this was what he was supposed to do. But this was pre-Damascus Saul, pre-Damascus Saul. And boy, was he going to be in a shock. <laughs> because Jesus was going to do supernatural intervention. Let's move. Verse 3 and 4. As he traveled and approached Damascus, suddenly, do you all like the suddenlies? I love the suddenlies. Immediately, suddenly. I love that when I see in the Bible. Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him, displaying the glory and majesty of Christ. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice from heaven saying to him, Saul, okay, let me try. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting and oppressing me? The first thing we see here, right from the very beginning, is that God is the initiator. God is the initiator of the intervention. Okay, Jesus literally stopped Saul right in his tracks. And Jesus called Saul by name. Saul, Saul. He's the first mover. Jesus is the first mover, the initiator in revealing himself. Do you know, in, in all our stories, for all of us, God is the initiator. God is the initiator. We may not have like a, a drama, drama one like this, you know, wow, boom, 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 lights and, you know, all that. <laughs> it may not be like that. But God, in all of our lives, is the initiator. Not a single one has turned to God on our own. Ephesians 2, I put the verse there, 2, 1 to 5, it tells us that we were dead in our sins. Dead in our sins, but because of God's great love 
for us. He made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead. Yeah. A person who is dead, you go, Ta-da! he's not going to respond to you. <laughs> we were dead in our sins, but because of God's great love, He initiated first. He initiated first. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead. It is by God's grace that we have been saved through faith. Through faith. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were still dead in our sins, comatose in our sins, not not looking to, to find God, He died for us. Christ, God, is the initiator. Even for Saul, right? Saul experienced this saving grace firsthand, right? Though he didn't think it, surely, because he was faultless, faultless, he was dead to Christ. But Jesus sought him out, intervened, boom. And the thing is that God continues to seek us out today. He continues to seek to save the lost. He continues to to reach out so that He can speak to us. He continues to intervene in our lives. He is the initiator. But even then, Saul had no idea who this heavenly being was, right? He he said, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? And and, And he answered, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. I am Jesus. I am Jesus. You see, it was important for Saul. It was important that before anything, before Saul could be the apostle to the Gentiles, whom he was meant to reach out to, he had to encounter the risen Jesus first. First. Because as far as Saul knew, this this man was a fraud. As far as, as Saul knew this man was the reason why he had to go and persecute the Christians to begin with. He had to encounter Jesus himself. And just as Jesus called Saul by name, Jesus too calls us by name. But he calls us to what? He calls us first to himself. He calls us first to himself. I am Jesus. He calls us first to himself, that we may know him, to be known by him, and to know him. The thing is that who is calling has, has immense effect, right, on whether you would answer the call or not. Just now, Jeremy, hello, hello. <laughs> Unfortunately, today, does your phone ring a lot? My phone rings a lot, and it's not people that I know, right? There are many prank calls nowadays. Do you receive or not? Right? The moment my phone rings, what do I do? I actually look, I see in the front, got, got all this uh, like international code or not. Right? If you see these international codes, if you see the plus six five, if I see plus six five, uh, I will put down. I'll disconnect. Why? Because I know. Because I mean, hello. This is the Ministry of Education. Hello. This is DBS Bank. Hello. This is what? The people prank call. If it's a prank call, I'm, no, I'm not going to pick it up. I put down, I put down, disconnect. But what if it was God? But what if it was God on the line? Will you answer? You see, who is on the line has an immense effect because the call, behind the call is a caller. It's a caller. And you must know who's calling because if it's God, will you answer? There was a story shared uh, by an author called Dave Harvey. He had a friend who was traveling. This was pre-COVID, okay? And this friend had picked up a flu that was not COVID. uh, And he was too sick to get out of bed, okay? So he spent three days stuck in a hotel room. This was before quarantine or anything. So three days he was stuck in a a hotel room because he was so sick. On the second night, he received a phone call. Normal people, if you're very sick, you probably will not answer the phone. But this guy, he picked it up. Pretend, okay. <laughs> picked up the phone, okay. He was in bed, okay. He picked up the phone. And it was the POTUS. Do you all know what is POTUS? Do you know who the POTUS is? If you watch like Designated Survivor or some of the law shows or whatever, you will realize that the POTUS is the President of the United States. P-O-T-U-S. Okay, so this guy had done some work for the President before. 
And the, the president had somehow found out that uh, he was unwell, and, and so he had, um, he, had, he had called to find out whether this guy was okay. But this guy, when he realized that it was the porters on the line, he was like sick, okay, in, in bed, in the hotel room. He got up, stand at attention, and took the phone call. <laughs> got up, he jumped out of bed to take the phone call at attention. In his boxes, okay, the, the author was, was clear to put that in as well. To continue the conversation. You see, no one else will have that, this kind of effect, right, on him, except the president of Vienna. This man is like thousands of miles away, but who was on the phone was important, that he stand at attention and answer the call. That was, that, that was funny. I, I always remember that. For us, today, God is calling. God is calling, right? God is always drawing us to himself, and, and he is calling us first and foremost to himself, to a relationship, into fellowship with him. First Corinthians 1.9, it says, God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. One of Reverend Francis's life verses, you will hear him quote it often, Romans 8, 28 to 30, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who, are, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, that's all of us, he called, he called. He also justified, those he called, he also justified, those he justified, he also glorified. See, we are called first to him, to fellowship with him, and then to be like him, to be like our master. Then Jesus continues, he said, oh, yeah, he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, right? Wait, wait, was Jesus there? Jesus was not there. He was supposedly, he already supposedly disappeared, right? Supposedly, he, thought he allegedly had ascended to heaven. So who was Saul persecuting? His followers. He was persecuting the followers of Jesus. And here, Jesus is saying to persecute his followers is to persecute him. Which means... To slander them is to slander him. To torture them is to torture him. To persecute them is to persecute him. Don't miss this. Jesus and his church and his people are one. They are one. We are the body of Christ. Not the body of five little road. <laughs> we are the body of Christ. If anyone persecutes the body of Christ, they persecute Christ. We need to remember this. This is both actually a, a comfort to us as well as a warning. Jesus feels all that we go through. Okay? He, you can be assured that God is completely aware, especially when we are hurt, when we are abused. God knows. Okay? We are His church. But we must also know that when we hurt God's people, we hurt Him whether by word or by action, we do the same to Christ. So it's both a comfort and a warning. But let's move on. Notice that God doesn't tell Saul what to do first, right? He leaves, uh, he leaves Saul in the dark, literally. Literally. Men traveling with Saul... Oh, I, oh, I have a verse here for you. Uh, Luke 10, 16. Uh, Jesus says, The one who listens to you listens to me. The one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects him, who is the heavenly Father who sent me. So if you, if you reject Jesus, uh, you reject us, the, the body of Christ, you reject him as well. So we are one. But let's move on. In, in Acts 9, verse 7, it says, The man traveling with Saul stood there speechless, right? Stood there speechless. They had heard the sound but did not see anyone. So Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. And for three days, he was blind. 
he did not see anything or eat or drink anything. Saul was blind. Blinded. Okay, not blind. Blinded for three days. You know, this was symbolic of his spiritual blindness. He may have been very zealous, but he was blind to God. God had to take away his eyesight so that he could have insight. I say that again. God had to take away his eyesight so that he could have insight. More than that, Saul was also completely helpless. You know, the man who was going to persecute, the man who was going to bring these people to prison, now I had to be led by, by his companions to Damascus because he couldn't see. He couldn't see. I believe God was showing him how he would have to be completely, completely dependent on him. And you know, numerous times, we, we see in the Bible, God says that he opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God had to humble this man. God had to humble this man. And sometimes we may be in a, in a, in a season where we feel that God is bringing us to a, that place of humbling. But always remember, it, is, it may be difficult to go through, but it is God's grace for us so that we will respond to him. So God was humbling Saul. And he had to fast and pray for three days. Have you ever wondered what went through his mind for three days? Uh, I, always, I always wonder, okay? But you hold that thought for a moment, okay? What, what he thought of for three days. Is God powerful? God is all-powerful, right? Which means that actually God could have just snapped his fingers, boom, and this man, Saul, would become Paul. <laughs> he could have just done like did whatever he could, and this man would be the apostle to the Gentiles. He could. He always can. God is powerful and able. But he doesn't. <laughs> Here we see God now calling another man, another man, and his name is Ananias. He is a disciple that is actually only ever mentioned within the context of Saul's encounter. And we, we know Ananias is a disciple, he is a disciple, but also in Acts twenty two twelve, it tells us that Ananias was a devout observer of the law and respected by fellow Jews. And so like Barnabas, remember we, we, we learned about Barnabas the last time, you know, he, Ananias was also instrumental in, in Saul's life. Don't ever think uh, that you are too insignificant for God to use. You know, this was the apostle to the, to, this was going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. This was like a big man. If you think uh, logically, God should have used a Peter or a James, right? To, yeah, for, to, to convert Paul in that sense. God should have used these big, big names. But he doesn't. He uses a non-public man like Ananias to be instrumental in Paul's life. God doesn't only want to use the Reverend Francis, the Reverend Stanley. No, God wants to use you. God wants to partner you. What do we just need to be? We need to all be like, like Ananias. He was an observer of the law, respectable, faithful, I believe, as a disciple of God. You're a disciple, God wants to use you. Okay, don't always look at the people on stage. Get what I mean? <laughs> Who is on stage now? Okay, no, don't always look at the people on stage. God wants to use you, okay? Uh, he wants to partner with you. And just like he called Saul, 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 he also called Ananias by name, by name. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and God called him in a vision, Ananias. And then, like the men who got the call from the POTUS, yes, Lord! <laughs> All right, immediately, right? No, no, no delay. Yes, Lord, he answered. Of course, it's easy to say yes, Lord, when you do not know what the assignment is, right? 
It's easy to say, oh, here I am, Lord, send me, when you don't know what the assignment is. <laughs> but for Ananias, then he says, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas, Judas on Straight Street. Um, this is not Judas of Iscariot. Uh. This is another Judas. This is Judas on Straight Street. And ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Hey, by the way, this is not the same Ananias as the Ananias and Sapphira in, in X5. I thought I better say that. Different Ananias. Uh, you know, they, they used to have a lot of uh, names that were common, like Judas, for example. Ananias. It's different Ananias, okay? So... Now, the call to Ananias was definitely not what he was expecting, correct? <laughs> to go to the chief persecutor of the Christians. Okay, think about it, think about it. What is a parallel? What might be a parallel today? Because we, if we try and understand at that time, we may not completely uh, appreciate how <laughs> drastic this call was for a man like Ananias, Right? Uh, you th think about it, okay? Because when I was thinking about it, I then, you know, Open Doors US, they, 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 they post and they tell each year, like, which are the most dangerous countries uh, for Christians. And in 2021, and there was this list where Christians were martyred most in 2020 and 2021. And there's a list of 10, 10 um, countries there. I'm not going to name them. But this is from that list there. Can you imagine if today it was Ananias, it might be likened to God saying, go to the, to the leader of one of these countries and go and pray for him. <laughs> you scared not? <laughs> I can tell you. Sure. I, I, would, be, I would definitely be terri terrified. So what does Ananias say? Lord! Ananias answered, I have heard many reports of this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. I, I looked at this report and I know that this man is no good. Okay? And he has come here okay, to Damascus with the authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. In a roundabout way, right, Ananias was asking God, are you sure? <laughs> indirectly saying, perhaps I don't want to go, I don't want to go. Honestly, okay, honestly, you want to go or not? I won't want to go, okay, honestly, I tell you, I would not want to go, right? I would do a Jonah, I would, I would buy a, <laughs> a train ticket or an airline ticket and I'll go to the furthest place on the other side of the globe. That's what I would do. But you know what, friends? God, God can take our questions. God can take our wrestling with him. You know, and, and God was gracious to Ananias. He wasn't upset that Ananias was questioning him. No. In fact, he responds. He responds to Ananias and he says, the Lord says to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. God had chosen Saul. God had chosen Saul, and he was going to be God's messenger to the Gentiles. So, okay, God may have thrown in the bit lah, that he would suffer. <laughs> Maybe that was a little bit comforting, that he would suffer, but God himself had called, God himself had spoken, and for Ananias, that settled it. So Ananias went to the house and entered it, Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't miss this. Brother Saul. Ananias was just questioning. He knows that this man is a persecutor. God says go, he goes. And what does he address Saul as? Brother not mister, not <coughs> brother, brother Saul. He is saying you are one of us. You are one of us. Even Judas, you know, Judas opened his home, right? Judas in Damascus opened his home to this persecutor, 
to come in. Friends, this is the fellowship of believers. The fellowship of believers. God, God calls us, God initiates, God calls us to Himself, but He also calls us to a community, to the body of Christ, to, a, a, to the fellowship of believers. God calls us. We know that Saul was fasting and praying in darkness. I believe Saul, being a Pharisee, you know, he was learned in, in the law. He would have been going through a wow. Remember just now, I asked, what do you think Saul was thinking of for three days? I mean, I, I do believe, you know, he's a, because he's a Pharisee, he has all the law in his mind. Okay, he has all the scripture and all that in his mind. He would have been going through, going through, piecing together, piecing together scripture and what he encountered with Jesus and making that connection. I also believe that Saul probably had to, was confessing like, oh my goodness me. Now that I know, what have I done? What have I done? Confession, repentance, I'm sure that was all in the mix for Saul. But, but God reveals to him, God reveals to, to Saul that there will be a man coming to pray for him. There will be a man coming to pray for him and to help him restore his sight. And Ananias did, right? Ananias did. And immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And then he got up and was baptized. And after taking food, he regained his strength. And Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. The fellowship of believers welcomed Saul, this persecutor of the Christians. They welcomed him. You know, I, do, I believe in part due to Ananias' uh, faithfulness to answer the call to go and pray for Saul. But he got up. Saul got up, right? After the scales fell from his eyes, he got up. And you know what? He got baptized. Don't miss this also. We're going to have baptism. We put up a call for baptism. Baptism was a, think about, okay, public, it was a public demonstration, a public proclamation of your faith. Okay, uh, it, it is not sheepishly go somewhere, ta -da. <laughs> no. It was a public demonstration of the faith. And more than, more than just a public profession of his faith, it was, you know, baptism is also an initiation into the body of Christ. There are many, there are many reasons why baptism is so important. That's why Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations, teaching them, baptizing them. Because baptism is not just a profession of what you believe, but now an identification with the people of the way. Identification, that means they become part of the community. That is very important. Do not miss this. Just one word, baptism, but it means so much. Do you know that in the first century, when you get baptized, you, 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 get, you get one of the souls come, come after you <laughs> because you identify with these people. That is, that, is, that is baptism. It may be lost a little bit today, but during that time, it was very powerful and very important in identifying with the community. And so now Saul was legitimately part of the community. You know, just because you have perhaps an ugly past, perhaps you may feel unsavable, perhaps you have done something in the past, doesn't mean that the community does not accept you. The thing is the fellowship of, the believer, of believers welcomes all who call on the name of Jesus. We become brother, sister. Sometimes, they, you know, nowadays, they, the young people, they call each other bruh. I don't get it. Okay, I don't, I don't quite get it. But it's not like that, okay? <laughs> no, this is truly brother. <laughs> no, one is, no one is beyond the reach of God. And no one is excluded from the fellowship of believers. When you know Jesus... For sure. But my last point is this, that then God calls us to a life of purposeful duty. See, God has plans. God believes that the world should be saved. It's, not his, it's his desire that all, all be saved and all come into the saving knowledge of who he is. 
but he partners with us. He delights to partner with his people. That's why he will partner with an Ananias to, to be instrumental in Saul's encounter with Jesus. Like I said, God can just, uh, oh, all saved. But he does not. He does not. He delights to partner with his people. And so he, he gives us purpose in, in, in duty, in what we do for him. For, for Saul, at once, okay, I like all this, immediately, suddenly, at once, <laughs> Saul began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. He knew he was going to be, right, the apostle to the, to the Gentiles. And at once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and they asked, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his on, his, on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them prisoners to the chief priests? Yet, Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus. By what? By proving that Jesus is the Messiah. This is why I believe in the, those three days, Saul was really going through all the scriptures that he knew, what he thought he knew. Because the moment he came out of it, he was able to prove he was like apologist of the apologists during that time, that Jesus is the Messiah. Literally MTL. You know what MTL? Do you all know what's MTL? My Tu Liao. We saw immediately. My Tu Liao. I'm going out. I'm going to prove that Jesus is the Messiah, right? The one who opposed God became his... The one who was his most passionate adversary became his most fervent champion, became God's most fervent champion. The one who was zealously persecuting the Christians became one of the most zealous evangelists. No one is beyond the reach of our loving and gracious God. Now, I was, you know, I grew up with Ram Francis, right? He, you... If you listen to his testimony, you will realize, wow, he was, he was very involved in like the occult and all the spiritual things. You know, growing up with him, I saw all of that. But to the degree that he was involved in all of that, when God turned him around, oh, I see now he's Baron Francis. <laughs> no one is beyond saving. No one is beyond using but the more you see how God has saved you, despite your nonsense in the past, the more you want to serve Him. The more you want to serve Him. And, you know, with regards to duty and calling, you know, I must remind us again that this is actually my last point. A lot of, a lot of times we have people come to us as pastors. Pastor, pastor, I want to know what my calling is. Pastor, pastor, I want to know what I'm supposed to do. But if you start with that, you're asking the wrong question. You're asking the wrong question. If you start with what am I called to do, you will miss the fact that you are first called to a who. A who before do. So life of purposeful duty comes at the, at the last point. It's my last point. Start with who am I called to? And when I know the caller, the one who created me, the one who knows me, the one who has the best plans for me, and sometimes it might include some humbling, sometimes it might include some suffering, I can still say, where you call, I will go. Where you call, I will go. You know, I, I often get asked, uh, how do you know, Trish, how do you know that you are called to be a worship leader or a pastor? I didn't. <laughs> if I had been told a long, long time ago that you are called to be a pastor, I will do a Jonah, right? <laughs> right. I would run. And although the suggestion was made a few times, I, I, <laughs> I was very sure that I was, I was blind to it. I was maybe like, <laughs> saw three days. <laughs> but I know that I'm first called to God. First call to God. And, then, and I trust Him to place me where He deems best. Where He deems best, okay? So, I look back on my own life. 
okay? I look back on my own life and I see that as I have yielded my life to him, he has caught me in many ways. He has caught me in many ways. I, I was led into full-time ministry in 2004. Some of you are, actually most of you are born, right? <laughs> Sometimes when I say, when I, when I read dates, right, then I, da -da 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 in my mind, who is, who hasn't been born yet? <laughs> That's why I realize how old I am. <laughs> but, <clears throat> I was led into full-time ministry in 2004. And then the next year, I got married uh, to James, and then I went to, I was, we went to England for two years. When I was in England, God called me or led me to be part of a cell group from, in a church. And this cell group, and for two years, all I did was lead worship in this cell group. And all, all, the, all the people in this cell group were old. I was at that time... Uh, in my early, t in my mid-twenties, I won't tell you exactly how, then you calculate what, then you know how old I am. Uh, but every week I would go to this cell group, to one, somebody's house, and I would just lead worship, this young Chinese girl leading worship every week for this group of old people. But that was my ministry at that time for two years. And then when I came back to Singapore, I was, you know, God, you are my, my God, Two children, okay? And when I had Sarah Ann, my younger one, I, I stopped um, work at that time, stopped ministry for a while. And I became a stay-at-home mom. I became a stay-at-home mom. But that was also a calling because I got to meet so many mummies at the kindergarten and I got, had a marketplace ministry, marketplace ministry with all the mummies there. I was called there for that season. When I surrendered to him even more, continue surrendered to him, he, he led me to lead the worship team here in Covenant Vision Christian Church. Even though from a musical, technical point of view, my team will tell you I'm not very qualified. In fact, some of the people who are on this stage today are there because I cannot do what they do. But he led me to lead the worship team here. But because I felt not so qualified, never mind, I was led to join a worship school in 2016, and it was actually in the worship school called Awakened Generation that God called a few, what they call Ananiases, along my path to say, God's called you to be a pastor in 2016. And so in 2016, I said, yeah, okay, God, I'll be your pastor, pastor here at Covenant Vision Christian Church. And he continued to use me since then here, but also in kingdom assignments outside. Where he calls, I'll go. So I mentor a group of young, young past female pastors outside. And then in 2019, before COVID, I was given the opportunity to go to Israel. And I remember at the Qumran Caves, you know the Qumran Caves is where the, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? And I, was, I remember I was there. And it was in, in one of the, and, and, this, and the guide was, was talking, about, uh, talking about how the Essenes were so dedicated in putting down, the, to, in, to copying the scrolls, copying the word of God religiously. And as I was there at the Qumran Caves, God said, go to school, go to school. <laughs> Actually, I want to go to school many years ago already, but that dream was squashed. But when I was in Israel, when I was sitting there, God says, now is the time. You can go to school. And so in 2020, I, I enrolled and I became a student again. Still am a student. I'll graduate next year, but I'm still a student. But you, you see, it's not just, you are called to be a pastor, that's it. Ba, 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 ba. No. I'm called to God. Where he calls, where he leads me, I will go. I will answer the call, whether it's to go to school, whether it's to pastor, whether it's to sit with somebody across the table and hear them cry. I'm called to him first. That is my duty. And when he leads me, I know he will, he will use me. God doesn't call the qualified. I'm sure you've heard this term before. He qualifies the call. When you answer him, then he will give you what you need to fulfill that assignment at that moment. That is your call of duty to him first. And you know that when you have heard from the one, the, your commander-in-chief, he will give you all that you need 
to fulfill the call in that time and in that season. That is your duty. That is your duty. So Covenant Vision Christian Church, Let us remember that you are here, you, you, all of us, me also. We are here today because God, God is the initiator. He he was the first mover in reaching out to us so that he can bring us into fellowship and relationship with him. He calls you first and then foremost to himself. Number one, him. He also calls us to the community because we are the body of Christ. Friends, hear me, and, and don't, please don't be offended. That if you feel that you can be just the body of Christ on your own at home by yourself, it is not entirely wrong, but it's not complete. Your faith is not complete apart from the body of Christ. Because not, God not only calls us to Him, He calls us to the body. So don't, don't feel that you can be by yourself, you know. In fact, when you are lone wolf, you are a target for the devil. But when we are together, there's safety in the body. There's safety in the body when we can support and be with one another. But more than that, God calls us to purposeful duty. When we answer our call to Him, where He leads us, where we go, you can be sure that he will be glorified in and through your life as you answer your call to duty. Amen? Amen. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Friends, you know, if, if, if I had said something today that has stirred in your heart, I want to speak first and foremost to those who may not know Jesus yet. If you have... If you do not know Jesus as the Lord and Savior, I want you to know that He is calling you. And more than that, He is calling you by name. You may not know that He is, but He is. God desires that none should perish, but all come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And today, if you do not know or you have not acknowledged Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you this opportunity. The question is, will you answer? Will you answer His call? Because he's calling you by name and he says, will you come into fellowship and relationship with me? And if that is you, and if you have never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to put your hand on your heart and pray this prayer after me. If you are at home, if you are watching this for, and, and you are sensing that God is calling you and you want to say yes, put your hand on your heart and pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I hear you call my name and today I want to answer. I walk away from my past and I walk towards you. Forgive me of my sins. I turn from my past and I turn to you. I thank you, Lord, that you have died and you were raised from the dead so that I can have salvation in you today. I acknowledge you as my Lord and as my Savior. Today, I am a child of the living God. Amen. You know, if that was you, if you had said that prayer today, we want to pray with you. We want to talk to you. We want to to get to know you. We want to help you understand and to be part of the body of Christ together. If that is you, especially if you're online, there is a QR code that will come on your screen. There is a QR code that will come on your screen. It might take a little while, but don't worry, it will come. (laughs) Put your name in. We will contact you. For the rest of us here, there's another another question I want to ask you. Is there somebody in your mind that is unsavable, like a soul, who has done so much that you think that, oh, this one can never become Christian type? God has called this person, this person really cannot, unsavable, <laughs> unmovable. I want you to know 
that if God could save Saul, the chief persecutor of the Christians, God can save this person. It could be a child. It could be a prodigal child walked away from this faith. It could be a parent, an old parent. It could be someone who is living a life that you know is not pleasing to God. Anyone. Know that he, this person that God is bringing to your mind today is not too far that God cannot reach him or her. Do you have a name? I want you to think of this name because we want to pray for this person right now. With this name, I want to pray. Father Lord, we see, we see from your word, Lord, that no one is beyond your saving grace. Father, if you had saved Saul, if you had turned him around, if you had humbled him to the point where he realizes, Lord, that he had his eyes open, you can save, you can reach, you can draw this person that I'm thinking about. Lord, I want to commit, Lord, to praying for this person to see him or her come into the saving knowledge of God. We thank you, Lord. If you have intervened in Saul's life, you can also intervene in this person's life. We commit this name, we commit this person to you. We lay them at your feet. And Father, Lord, we pray, Lord, for salvation to come, for you to draw. And Father, Lord, for you to move mightily into this person's life. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. My third my third invitation is to all of us. To all of us. And my question is, will you say yes to committing your life again to the caller? That you will say, I, it, it's not about what I do, but it's about who I respond to. And I want to give you an opportunity. You know, all heads bowed, all, all eyes closed. I want to give you an opportunity to rededicate your life to the caller. And some of us may have said, I, I come week in, week out. I stand up every time. You can still stand up again. You can still respond to God again. And I want to give you the opportunity to opportunity to say yes to Jesus but yes to a deep fellowship with Him yes to a, a, a beautiful relationship with Him a, to surrender your life again to Him because when you surrender yourself your life to Him you, you put your hands up and you say I can't do it only you can Lord And if this is you, if you want to say yes to Jesus, say yes to the caller who's calling you, listen, if you close your, if you open your heart, you will hear him literally call you by name. Because that is God. And I want to invite you, if, if you want to say yes, you, I want to invite you to say yes to God. If there's you, can you just stand, stand where you are. Stand where you are and say, yes, God, I want to rededicate my life to you. I want to say yes to the caller. I want to be so sensitive, Lord, to, to what you're saying to me each and every day. Father, Lord, that if you say you go this way, I will go. If you say go that way, I will go. If you say to go to the difficult places, I will go. Even if you say rest, I will rest. If that is you, will you stand? I want to pray for you today. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for every person who is upstanding on their, on their feet. We thank you, Lord, for a yieldedness in their hearts to say that I want, I want to follow you, Lord. I want to heed the voice of my caller. I want to be like that man. The moment, God, you call, I'm going to get up from my bed and I'm going to stand at attention and to hear what you're saying to me today that I will move. I will, not be, I will not be sleeping. I will be awake for you, Lord. 
And Father, we know, Lord, that it is not that we need to be qualified in order to be called, but Lord, that when we say yes to you, Lord, then you empower us, you equip us, and you lead us where you want us to go. And so, Father, today, I thank you, Lord, for everyone who's standing. Lord, will you hear their yes? Will you see their yes? And will you respond even as they respond to you? Thank you, Jesus. You know, I'm going to ask the, the worship team to, to lead us in this song. But as, especially for those who are standing, I want to invite everybody now to stand, but especially for those who are standing, as you sing this song, I want to invite you to come forward and, and allow us as pastors to pray with you. Allow us as pastors to stand with you as you answer the call of your caller to say yes. So will you, will you sing this song? Jesus, I come and surrender my heart to you. Hallelujah. And we will be here. We, the pastors, will be here. But sing and move and respond to the 